Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining today's webinar. I am Anna. I am a project associate at Clean Energy States Alliance, and I will be hosting today's webinar. Uh, the title is New Federal Money for Energy Storage, the Inflation Reduction Act, the talk of the town. Uh, this webinar is a presentation of the DOE OE Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership, also known as STAP. STAP is a collaboration between the U.S. Department of Energy, Sandia National Laboratories, and the Clean Energy States Alliance. Thank you also to one of our panelists, Russ, from Clean Tech Strategies, uh, for supporting the development of this webinar. Before we go any further, let's go through some quick webinar logistics. You'll notice you have a webinar console, which should look like the picture that's shown on the screen here to the left. You can use the console to adjust your audio. Either you can listen from your computer speakers or you can join via telephone. All of our attendees are in listen only mode. Near the bottom of the console, you'll see there's a box where you can write and submit your questions to us. We're hoping to reserve at least 20 minutes for Q&A at the end of the webinar. Please submit your questions when you think of them though. Do not wait until the Q&A session. We'll get to as many questions as we can. If you'd like to view the speaker's presentation slides in full screen, you can do that by minimizing the webinar console. You just need to click on the orange arrow, which you'll see is circled on our sample webinar console. Click that arrow again to expand the webinar console. One final note, this webinar is being recorded. We will upload the webinar recording as well as all of the speaker's presentation slides to our website within the next week and then send that information along to you all in an email. Uh, you can also find it on our website, csa.org backslash webinars. That is a great URL to have handy because that is also where we um, have all of our future webinars listed and where you can RSVP to join those as well. And with that, I will pass this over to my colleague, Todd Alinsky-Paul. He is a senior project director at Clean Energy States Alliance, and he will be moderating today's webinar. Thank you, Anna, and welcome to the webinar, everybody. We have... Uh, done many of these in fact this i think is the final webinar in this year's STEP series uh, so if you've been attending and you've enjoyed these i appreciate it and we thank you for continuing to uh, sign up for these webinars we do our best to make them as helpful and educational as we can uh, we are already planning for a whole batch of new webinars in the coming year so We'll tell you a little bit about some of those at the end. Uh, first of all, I need to do some brief uh, introductions and give you a little bit of information about CISA and STAP, and then we will introduce our speakers for today. So if you have not previously joined us, uh, welcome. This is the Clean Energy States Alliance, or CISA. Uh, CISA is essentially a membership organization for state energy agencies and you can see many of their logos on the slide if you just advance the slide please anna uh, we basically cisa helps these state agencies to administer plan and improve their clean energy programs of all kinds uh, among other things we also administer something called stap this is the energy storage technology advancement partnership uh, stap is conducted under a contract with Sandia National Laboratories. It's funded by US DOE Office of Electricity, and we have Dr. Jook here today from DOE OE, who's going to make some introductory remarks. Uh, STAP is a, uh, well, a partnership that primarily exists to facilitate demonstration energy storage projects, and we do this across the nation. You can see in the graphic there, uh, some call outs of some of these projects. Uh, essentially, we help to bring together DOE with uh, Sandia National Laboratories, state partners, utility partners, uh, community partners, and others to create and support these demonstration projects. We also do a lot of knowledge sharing through these webinars, as well as other things, such as conference presentations, case studies, and the like. And we support state energy storage efforts with uh, policy and technical assistance. So what that looks like is that we work with uh, state energy agency officials, policymakers, regulators, people who are trying to develop new programs, policy and regulation to support energy storage in their states. 
We help them to put these programs together. Uh, we provide all kinds of assistance with that, as well as uh, just putting out general policy information. Uh, for example, we have a report coming up with Sandia on uh, energy storage policy at the state level to support decarbonization, and that should be coming out in a month or two. Next slide, please. So uh, before I go further, I want to thank Dr. Emery Zhuk, Director of Energy Storage Research at US DOE Office of Electricity, and Dan Vornio, Engineering Project and Program Lead at Sandia National Laboratories for supporting this program. Next slide, please. So uh, today's speakers, I'll give a very brief introduction to each. I'm gonna do that now, and then I won't uh, introduce them as we go through uh, from one speaker to the next, so I don't interrupt the flow of the presentation. We'll start with uh, remarks from Dr. Zhuk, the Director of Electrical Energy Storage Research at DOE Office of Electricity. He's directed the Energy Storage Research Program for two decades, supervising the ARA stimulus funding for grid-scale energy storage demonstrations and partnering with states on numerous energy storage demonstration projects. His work has led to 11 R&D 100 awards, two EPA Green Chemistry Challenge awards, and a Lifetime Achievement Award, and he is internationally recognized as a leader in the energy storage field. We will then hear from Russ Weed, founder of Clean Tech Strategies. Uh, Russ established Clean Tech in 2018 after 21 years of work in business and legal positions, including at General Electric and in the flow battery pioneer company UET, and 10 years as a commercial and litigation attorney. Uh, Clean Tech Strategies focuses on energy storage, renewables, power electronics, microgrids, and advanced materials, offering consulting and engineering services. And we want to thank Russ additionally for helping us to uh, assemble this panel of expert speakers today. Uh, also, we will be hearing from Gina Copeland Newfield at US DOE Office, uh, I'm sorry, DOE Energy Office. Uh, she is the policy chief of staff. She works in energy policy, obviously, and also oversees a number of clean energy policy initiatives. She was previously founding director of the Sierra Club's Clean Transportation for All campaign, where she led the organization's advocacy for the electrification of cars, trucks, and buses, as well as the defense of public transit policies and clean air standards. She's also worked for Physicians for Human Rights and the U.S. campaign to ban landmines and a Boston-based lead poisoning prevention initiative. And she served on the Massachusetts Zero Emission Vehicle Commission. We will hear then from Wayne Killen, Senior Consultant to DOE Loan Programs Office. Uh, Wayne provides outreach and business development for the transportation sector and associated supply chains, including electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Uh, the Programs Office currently has nearly $100 billion in low interest rate loans in the advanced technology vehicles manufacturing and innovative clean energy programs. Um, so this would be of great interest to anyone who is uh, looking to get a loan to uh, launch a new effort or technology or company. Um, STEP financing is designed to drive U.S. investment in clean energy solutions and advanced transportation. Wayne has over 30 years of experience with American, Asian, and European car companies. Finally, we will hear from Elizabeth Krauss, Partner and Practice Group Coordinator at KNL Gates. Elizabeth is the Practice Group Coordinator for KNL Gates's Global Power Practice, co-chair of the firm's ESG practice, co-chair of the Sustainability Initiative, co-director of the Seattle Chapter of Women of Renewable Industries and Sustainable Energy, and chair of the Renewable Hydrogen Alliance's Oregon Policy Subcommittee, as well as a member of the Pacific Northwest Hydrogen Association Board Advisory Committee. She has over a decade of experience assisting U.S. domestic and multinational investors, developers, and operators in the renewable energy and fuels, hydrogen, and carbon industries, particularly in regard to U.S. federal tax matters. So uh, those are our speakers for today. Um, go ahead and advance the slide, please, or pass it over to our first speaker. I just want to note that um, we do have a lot of people on this webinar, which is fantastic. Uh, we have an hour and a half, so we had, have 
uh, plenty of time for the speakers and we are going to have plenty of time to get to your questions which we will do after the final speaker is finished please do type those questions in as they occur to you i will be collating those and preparing them for when we can get to them at the end of the presentation so without further ado i'll pass this over to dr Juk. Uh, hello there i'm imre Juk and I direct the energy storage program at the Office of Electricity, Department of Energy. We all know that we have to decarbonize, not only electricity, but all the other sectors as well. Transportation, buildings, manufacturing, and agriculture. To do this, we will obviously need a huge amount of renewable energy. It could be fusion, but we really can't wait for that. And we all know that renewable energy is variable. So we will need a humongous amount of energy storage to make up for the gaps. We have done pretty well with short duration storage, say 15 minutes to four or six hours. We have viable business cases, we have analytics, and we have technology that has, has done well for us. It's lithium ion. But this isn't enough. We need medium duration storage to get through the night and long duration storage to back up a three day spell of bad weather. Not to mention a crowd of disasters that might happen. Unfortunately, there really isn't a good business case for medium and long duration storage. And so we have to, so we have seen very little of in the way of deployment, not counting, of course, pumped hydro. We know we will need it, but we can't as yet justify installing it. So this is where the infrastructure uh, bill money comes in. It will give us the funds to explore non-lithium uh, storage technologies and become familiar with them and build longer duration storage prototypes, preferably manufacturable in the US. But it's essential that we monitor, analyze and learn from these experiments, both the successes and the failures. And then we can use the new tax rebates to build fully functional facilities and move towards an equitable transition to a new energy ecology. The new IRA opportunities are a bit bewildering. And in this webinar, we will try to clarify a bit which of them are most relevant to energy storage and how to use them. I hope we will end up with a whole lot of fantastic new projects, which we can use as a next step towards a decarbonized future. Thank you. Russ, you're on. Good morning, good afternoon. Russ Weed uh, from Cleantech Strategies. Uh, the focus today is on IRA, Inflation Reduction Act, including policy, tax credits, and loan programs. But I also want to situate IRA in the overall new federal funding that's benefiting energy storage. And that would include, importantly, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, IJA, sometimes called BIL. Uh, in this presentation, um, There's a bit of latency. Uh, give a very quick bit of information about the Cleantech Strategies team and then advance the thesis, which I believe just was advanced by IMRA, uh, that uh, 15 billion in IJA grant funding of storage and grid resiliency should, I would say must, result in knowledge and experience that we can manage prudently the 200 billion in IRA tax credits for clean electricity and clean manufacturing and the many billions in IRA loan authorizations in those areas as well. So a number of parts to that, uh, the 15 billion under IJA, knowledge and experience, 200 billion for tax credits, and then the many billions in IRA and loan authorizations. We'll hear uh, from Gina and Wayne and Elizabeth as to all those in some detail. 
On my part, I'm going to briefly, quickly update uh, some of the IGIP programs that specifically uh, directly or indirectly benefit storage because it fits into this thesis. And then uh, focus particularly on clean electricity a little bit, uh, but more so on the clean manufacturing tax credits. And then take a look back at the thesis and how it holds up and how we go further with it, because this is not the end of the story. Briefly on clean tech strategies, you can see the, the background for the three of us, uh, Bob, Chris, and I. I'm an energy storage veteran. Uh, Bob is an electrical engineer with many, many years of experience in the power industry and grid modernization. And Chris is a DC veteran with many years of experience in the Beltway, the other Washington, as I like to refer to it since I live in Seattle. Okay, so. Some of you have seen a prior webinar on IJA and this slide. So 15, over $15 billion when you go through IJA in whole to look for uh, funding that could either directly or indirectly benefit energy storage. How much of that has now come out uh, under a FOA, also known as an RFP, right? Four of them, four of the eight buckets have come out. That's the... Um, blue highlighted rows that you can see here. Uh, under the image, uh, the storage demonstration program and the GRIP program, the Grid Resilience and Innovation Partnerships program from the Grid Deployment Office. And then uh, you have seen these uh, and they are updated. So briefly, the demonstration projects program, 355 million. Uh, LOIs for that were due yesterday. Full applications due in March. So uh, a good number of us on this have uh, this webinar have been working very hard on this area, I'm sure. Uh, also out, uh, uh, part of GRIP, uh, two and a half billion of the five billion under this particular program was already awarded in November uh, based on formulas and two and a half billion uh, under competitive grants with concept papers due today. Uh, so for those of you who see this as a recording, because you're getting your uh, concept papers in as we speak, uh, hope it has all gone well and look forward to the much uh, great amount of work ahead. Same thing for this other part of uh, the grid resiliency program. Again, concept papers due today. And then there's a third part where there's a little bit more time, uh, concept papers due another 5 billion uh, due in, in mid-January. So that all has uh, come out. Uh, there are four of the programs that have not yet uh, issued FOAs. that are blue highlighted here. Quickly, the long duration demonstration initiative. Uh, 100, there's 150 million in total, including the joint program. 30 of it has come out through a lab call, 120 million to come, including 75 million for demonstration initiative. In other words, mid TRL, mid technology readiness, four to six, uh, and then 45 million to go for DOD joint program projects. Uh, another uh, resilience, uh, grid resilience program, uh, there was an RFI that was due just a little bit earlier this month and we shall see uh, a foe on this soon, I would expect. And same on this, uh, advanced energy manufacturing, and recycling, 750 million. Just a couple of days ago, uh, Notice of Intent came out to issue a FOA in February. So here this one comes as well. And then finally, the Mine Lands program, 500 million. And DOE has uh, indicated they expect proposals to be solicited in 2023. So those are the four uh, that aren't yet out. And when you total them, sorry, uh, again, 15 billion. Now, and you can notice in the upper right hand corner, uh, there was a little color button. If we're talking about IJA, you can see the color button in the upper right hand corner. And then when we go over to IRA here, Inflation Reduction Act, the little red button up at the top. So 15 billion IJA, 369 billion for climate and energy provisions under IRA. Uh, this is an accumulation of various sources studying IRA. So of that 369 billion or thereabouts, uh, almost 200 billion of that 
is uh, allocated towards clean electricity and clean manufacturing tax credits. And you can see here, 161 billion for clean electricity, 37 billion for clean manufacturing. I'll, I'll go back, I'll, I'll dig into more of what each one of those is. But you would of course ask at this point, is this, um, is this are these numbers finite numbers? Uh, these are the specific amounts of allocation and you cannot exceed them or are these scores? Is this scoring of the, the budget and the appropriations? The answer is the latter. So these numbers could actually become larger if uh, uh, applicable tax credits, uh, if, if projects uh, uh, were uh, eligible for the tax credits, these numbers could in fact be higher and uh, hopefully they are. So focusing just for a little bit on the clean electricity tax picks, because I expect Elizabeth, uh, since she is a tax attorney and you see mentioned here of IRS, uh, she is much more informed on this topic than I. But to highlight one important thing, uh, really important, is that finally we have energy storage eligible for the investment tax credit on a standalone basis. One does not have to prove that the energy storage is being charged with so-called green electrons. Also, other forms of uh, energy or energy technologies are now also eligible for ITC. So great. Uh, you will also hear, I believe, more on uh, a, I think, fairly important uh, addition to the ITC, which is now the kind of nominal target of 30% uh, tax credit uh, is subject to two very important requirements, uh, prevailing wage and apprenticeship. Not seeking to go into those, but to highlight that uh, without those, you're uh, at one-fifth, you're at 6%. Now to spend more time on a new part uh, that's added by IRA, uh, clean manufacturing production tax credits. And so this is not where you get a tax, a tax credit for investing in and building a factory, manufacturing facility. That's ITC, investment tax credit. This is PTC, production tax credit. And this new program, uh, is where if you produce a qualifying component, uh, at least for a period of time, and then subsequent to that, it becomes just whether it's a greenhouse gas, greenhouse gas uh, reducing. But for this time period that we're in now, uh, it's if you produce certain kinds of components, you will get a production tax credit for producing those widgets. And included in those various kinds of clean energy components are battery components. And uh, as you can see here from the numbers circled, these are very substantial tax credits for production tax credits. So both in the case of uh, towards the bottom, critical materials, 10% uh, of production cost, uh, then next step in the supply chain, uh, electrode active materials, materials, another 10%. Uh, and then when you, continue up the supply chain, cells and modules up to, if you don't break up the cell tax incentive by itself for, for battery modules, $45 per kilowatt hour, very substantial. Now, going back to the uh, building of a factory that uh, produces clean energy components, it used to be, as you can see up at the top here, these are you know, statutes, right? Um, it used to be that you could only get the ITC, an investment tax credit for building a factory that produced energy storage for EVs. But uh, under IRA, below the red dotted line, that has been modified so that it is now all energy storage systems or components. In order to get that uh, investment tax credit for building such a manufacturing facility, uh, you have to submit a application to treasury. So one would expect this application process could be opening not too long from now, uh, perhaps February or thereabouts, 
that's when uh, the 180 days from when uh, the Infrastructure Reduction Act became law, uh, the 180 days that's in the statute for Treasury and the IRS to establish guidelines and so forth will have run its course. I believe it's February 12th. Uh, so in order to get that investment tax credit for building your clean uh, manufacturing facility, you're going to need to uh, pursue that with Treasury and file an application. But, this is a big but, eventually you shall have to pick, you shall have to elect, will you seek uh, and claim uh, investment tax credit for building the factory or the production tax credit for producing the clean energy components? It's clear under IRA that you are, will be required to elect. Then the question, I think the next obvious next question is, when do you have to elect? Uh, the answer at this time is to be determined. Uh, I was fortunate to have the opportunity to ask that question of the uh, just recently uh, uh, retired, though he's now at a law firm, uh, chief counsel for the Senate Finance Committee run by Senator Wyden, under which I was the I don't know if this is correct exactly to put anyway, there were if not primary jurisdiction a uh, great deal of jurisdiction over ira uh and posed this question when would when is the election required between the itc and the ptc and the answer to be determined so uh when manufacturers are planning uh in building up their u.s based clean manufacturing they'll need to have a, a, a strategy uh to to um deal with this election and not it being clear yet when the election is going to be required. Short version, go after the ITC under 48C and be ready to make the election to the production tax credit if your pro forma show that you'll have a higher return. Uh, other things that uh, clean tech strategies would recommend on the clean manufacturing tax credit side to companies. Uh, so seek engagement with the IRS and the Treasury and, and study their resources. Uh, Todd kindly pointed out and got it in here. The uh, Treasury just issued a hand, a guidebook uh, on IRS, so there's the link. Uh, continue to engage with DOE and its various offices. Uh, pursue engagement with trade associations on these tax credits. Uh, you can learn a lot from law firms, as just mentioned. Um, and generally keep working up your knowledge and expertise and strategize on uh, timing and cross-pollinization between your clean manufacturing tax efforts. So going back to the thesis that the 15 billion in IJA grant funding must result in the knowledge and experience uh, that we can use to prudently um, uh, utilize the 200 billion in tax credits and the many billions, which we will learn from Wayne, I believe, in loan authorizations. So that's the thesis. Is it logical? I would submit that it is. Uh, are there good and or bad past examples of where you have grant funding at a certain quantum and then tax credits and loans at you know magnitude of order larger uh, and are there good examples of that and bad examples of that? Please send to me if, if you have a particular ones in mind. And then uh, another evaluative uh, factor. So what's the evidence and the resulting findings and conclusions? And uh, having briefly seen uh, the Gina's presentation about to come, I think you're about to see some evidence uh, supporting the thesis. So thanks for your interest. And if you're interested in any more information, there's an appendix at the end of this that you could give a look at. Thank you. Okay, I think it's my turn. Hi, everybody. I'm Gina Copeland Newfield. I'm Chief of Staff in the Office of Policy at the US DOE. My webcam wasn't compatible with this. Um, uh, webinar platform, so you only get my voice, but I'll try to keep it high energy so you can follow along. So let's go to the next slide here. So at DOE, we like to um, think about uh, the Inflation Reduction Act 
uh, in uh, ways that are sort of comparable to the body, right? So you've got the, the backbone um, of the bipartisan infrastructure law, um, which is really making the largest long-term investment in our nation's infrastructure in nearly a century. We've got the BRAIN, which is the Chips and Science Act, which invests in cutting edge science and innovation to boost American competitiveness, including for semiconductors. And we've got the lungs, which is the Inflation Reduction Act, which really breathes life or into our clean energy economy by incentivizing deployment of clean technologies and lowering energy costs for American families and businesses. So let's go to the next slide here. And actually, let's, let's skip to the next one. So IRA delivers some really historic firsts, right? So we've got long-term stability, finally, finally, right? To domestic clean energy producers, manufacturers, investors, specifically solving what's really been on again, off again patterns for clean energy tax credits over the past many years. IRA also provides first-time per unit production incentives for solar, wind, batteries, critical minerals. It's a historic focus on quality of labor, as Russ was alluding to. It provides consumers with incentives worth thousands of dollars in home and transportation energy bill savings. So a used EV tax credit and a rebate program, higher incentives for lower income consumers that can, for example, cover 100% of the cost of switching to an electric heat pump. It includes specific benefits for middle and low income consumers. And then some really strong um, provisions for communities, particularly those that, that have been disproportionately impacted by pollution. And last, certainly not least, um, it's expected to reduce greenhouse gas pollution by about 40% below 2005 levels by 2030, which is tremendous. It's not gonna get us all the way there, but it is tremendous. So let's go to the next slide. And I thought this group would find this interesting. So our team at DOE did some number crunching and found that IRA slashes GHG pollution in a lot of areas, particularly strong in the power and industry sectors, also in buildings and transportation as well. So let's go to the next slide. So as was mentioned, IRA is gonna really stimulate clean energy investment projected to support jobs. So we've estimated about 1 million jobs annually. We're really expecting many of those to be uh, in the storage space. Prevailing wage standards in IRA will ensure that energy sector jobs are good paying, career track jobs, and apprenticeship requirements will create new opportunities for workers to access paid on the job training opportunities. A large majority, about 75% of these jobs will not require a four-year college degree, um, and the companies wishing to receive the full credit will be required to pay provide prevailing wages and offer apprenticeships, so five times the amount in incentives uh, if companies um, are, are um, providing those kinds of incentives for their workers. Um, and, you know, on apprenticeships, our team, which hosts the Office of Energy Jobs, has found that apprenticeships can really change lives, allowing workers to train on the job. Um, that we found that uh, apprenticeship programs can result in about a 47% increase in income for women and 30% for men. Um, one thing that I think is worth mentioning on this topic is that studies have shown that there could be health and safety problems with battery storage installation. So it's really important for the people hired um, to install storage, um, as well as you know many of the other products that IRA is going to incentivize um, to be trained electricians. Um, so trained electricians installing these battery products. All right, let's go to the next slide. So as Russ was talking about, there's a lot of exciting uh, provisions in IRA regarding clean electricity. Um, so we've got um, the transition to a tech neutral investment tax credit and production tax credit for any zero emission technologies. 
um, projects can choose either the 30% ITC or an inflation adjusted um, $26 per megawatt hour for the first 10 years of production. These credits really provide significant certainty, we think, for industry as they begin to phase out when power sector emissions reach 25% or less of their 2022 levels and no earlier than 2032. So some real long-term certainty there. Let's go to, actually, we'll stay on this slide for another moment. So the tech neutral approach um, means all zero emitting technologies qualify, including renewables, including new nuclear and energy storage. We've got separate 10% bonuses available for meeting domestic content criteria and or for being located in an energy community, those that have previously relied on fossil fuel production. These bonuses stack, meaning that a project located at a former coal plant, brownfield site, for example, meeting domestic content requirements could earn a 50% ITC or over $30 per megawatt hour PTC. There are additional allocated ITC bonuses for wind and solar projects located and benefiting low-income and tribal communities. The existing tax credit for carbon capture and sequestration are extended and enhanced, providing 12 years of $85 per metric ton of CO2 geologically stored for power facilities. In addition to the tax credits, there are other programs aimed to support clean electricity. So DOE has allocated $2 billion to make direct loans to finance transmission facilities. Um, and DOE has $770 million for DOE grants to facilitate siting and planning for interstate, regional, or offshore transmission lines. Let's go to the next slide here. All right, so I'm going to defer to my colleagues to really go into more nitty gritty around the storage provisions, but I've put up on the slide here some of the details of those storage provisions in relation to the investment tax credit for storage, the advanced manufacturing production tax credit, the home energy equipment credit, the LPO energy infrastructure reinvestment program, the USDA assistance for rural electric co-ops, and 48C allocated advanced energy project credit. And then the last slide here um, about accessing IRA storage benefits. So updates to 48 ITC and manufacturing PTC will go into place January 1st. The tech neutral ITC will replace the tech specific clean energy generation credits beginning in 2025. And the US Department of Treasury will release specific guidance for each of those credits describing more information about how to access their benefits. So with that, uh, I will stop there and pass it to the next speaker. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Gina, um, and thanks again to Clean Energy Group for having the Department of Energy join this gathering today. Um, welcome, everybody. So I'm uh, Wayne Killen again. I'm uh, an outreach and business development uh, counselor at the uh, Loan Programs Office, and in my role, promote the program, of course, but more importantly, we work with individual applicants to understand their project, help them shape it to the requirements of the Loan Programs Office, and uh, and uh, hopefully lead them to success. So the title of my remarks today is Building a Bridge to Bankability. We're gonna explain what that is, and, and I think the unique role that the Loan Programs Office plays now and has for over a decade in helping finance innovative clean energy projects and transportation, and frankly, getting them from uh, completion of development through commercial readiness to market acceptance. Next slide. <clears throat> So I think it's useful to start the explanation of the bridge bankability with a quote from our executive director, Jair Shah, who's really uh, restarted the whole office um, uh, spring of uh, 2021. He was quoted uh, in an article at that time that there are many areas that are mature from a technology standpoint, but not mature from an access to capital standpoint. That's a nexus where there's a clear mandate for the LPO to participate. 
And a good analogy to think about what that means is over a decade ago, uh, wind and solar projects uh, still being new, uh, those were areas that the loan programs office into. And we uh, loaned billions of dollars uh, for projects in those sectors. And today, many years later, those, those sectors are, they've crossed that bridge to bankability, traditional financial sectors can support them and we have great uh, growth rates as a result. That's what we wanna sort of rinse and repeat in a lot of other sectors that I'll touch on. Next slide. Okay, so here is the bridge to bankability quite literally. And a lot of uh, startup companies or even seasoned ones uh, begin new technology development on the left side. And again, going through prototyping, development, uh, proof of concept, the engineering equivalent would be getting to a TRL-8 stage, technical readiness level. That's a, a prime target for us to step in, but also a point at which the traditional banking sector is not comfortable uh, supporting those projects. They don't have the means to do due diligence, the capital is there. That is exactly where we step in. And you can see along the bottom here, there were several steps across that bridge where you're applying the engineering, there's construction risk sometimes and getting commercially ready, establishing a market demand, of course, is so important. And then finally getting securitization in the traditional financial markets. That's the goal. We wanna take companies across that bridge that are either doing manufacturing projects or deployment. And at that stage, of course, the traditional financial sector should be able to support them. And we can go back to supporting other new technologies coming to market. Next slide. Excuse me, uh, Wayne, this is Todd. Could you yeah. just try to get a little closer to your microphone? Your voice is uh, going a little in and out. Sure, uh, sure. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So uh, maybe a quick mention of the report card where we are today. Uh, again, we've been back in business a little over a year, but we're already at nearly 100 loans with about a hundred billion dollars in value. And we're taking in about one and a half applications per week, which is great. And this was even before Inflation Reduction Act passed. So we expect more business to be coming our way as a result. On the right side, you see a, a drill down of some of the sectors that we're supporting. Uh, at the top left corner is the ATVM loan. So a lot of uh, zero emission vehicle uh, plant projects, components that go into those vehicles, battery uh, projects you saw this week. Uh, an announcement from General Motors and LG on the Ultimium project that we uh, put a couple of billion dollars into. But you see still advanced nuclear is important, biofuels, carbon capture. Down at the bottom, you'll see critical materials for batteries, hydrogen, even EV charging is a priority for the office, but there's, there's many more as well. Next slide. So uh, after uh, Inflation Reduction Act passed, we're given new uh, credit subsidy fees, which in, in, in shorthand, a credit subsidy fee is, uh, is, a, is a budget we get to cover the risk of a project. The applicant does not pay. Those credit subsidy fees approximate into loan authority. You see there's three along the top there, the Innovative Clean Energy uh, loan that I'll talk about, which was well-funded before, we now have $40 billion in additional loan authority employment projects and clean energy. In the middle, we have our tribal program, which is similar to the loan I just talked about, Innovative Clean Energy. But it has um, a requirement of 51% or more tribal ownership in that project. That has 20 billion of loan authority. ATVM now is back to 40 billion. So you can see easily $100 billion for our three uh, prime loans. And uh, Gina mentioned the new energy infrastructure and reinvestment program. That's uh, section 1706. That has $5 billion, which would translate into $250 billion in loan authority. Briefly, that loan will cover projects that have ceased operations or want to improve their operations that say heretofore did uh, fossil fuel based energy generation or transmission. Uh, getting those uh, uh, technologies to clean pathways is what this loan is all about. Next slide. So let's talk a little more about advanced transportation today. I'm gonna to key this in on, on battery storage. Um, so eligibility for 
for, for over 10 years, light duty cars and truck was the focus of ATVM. So you can see the requirement there. Uh, recently, we've had a lot of startup uh, EV companies uh, come in and want to take advantage of this, uh, this loan product. But it also covers the components in the supply chain, batteries, and even the charging infrastructure. And thanks to bipartisan infrastructure legislation and Inflation Reduction Act, we have new categories to support ATBM. That includes rail, hyperloop, aircraft, and marine, and even medium and heavy-duty trucks. So we're already seeing a lot of activity in those two sectors. Briefly, the loans will cover acquisition of land, building a greenfield production facility, uh, tools, design, equipment, architecture, and even contractor expenses, anything needed to get that plant up and running. And on the far right, you can see the applicants we have right now. I want to focus on that storage in the middle. Really, we have the full gamut of battery technology from processing of minerals to assembly of the cells themselves. That could be cylindrical, prismatic, or a pouch. We've even got two solid state battery applicants on deck and a cathode and, an and anode technology uh, companies as well. So pretty good diversity of interest there. Next slide. So Title 17, Innovative Clean Energy is next. I want to talk about this one, whereas the previous loan focused on manufacturing, this one really leans into the deployment of those clean technologies. And so it will cover similar things, as asset acquisition, construction and deployment costs, anything needed to get that uh, clean energy solution up and running. Uh, current applicants we have are run the gamut again for storage, uh, anything from residential to scale. We've got one solution that's going to take the, uh, the uh, Hudson River in New York and put uh, batteries on barges there to provide mobile uh, support for growing uh, energy needs in that area as well as uh, EV charging. We've got uh, stationary battery storage, two applicants that are coming out with a new safer form of LFB chemistry, which would be great for urban environments and indoors. Uh, and then a couple of energy management solutions too. So even one applicant that wants to put battery storage on rail cars and ship them a day ahead to provide electricity in areas where it's going to be lacking. So a lot of variety in that uh, family too. Next slide. So the transaction process at LPO is pretty much similar to a traditional bank. There are a range of uh, pre-application consultations with my group, where again, we coach the applicant for success. That could take anywhere from a few weeks to a few months. Formal application submission, step two, group closing, roughly I would say takes eight to 10 months total. And that would uh, start out with uh, intake review, making sure the application is robust. We have all the answers to the questions we need. Then go into due diligence, draw up term sheets, and come to a conditional uh, credit letter at the end. Uh, so the average loan, I would say right now is literally a billion dollars, but we have anything from projects needing 50 million. And I would say in my portfolio for transportation, an average applicant is asking us for about $250 million. Next slide. So that's our program at a glance. Uh, Great source of low cost capital for projects. I, I want to stress that we're not 100% taking care of the cost of the project. There is a role for equity to play, but uh, I would say our, our applicants are finding us quite a compelling source now compared to the traditional banking sector. So at that point, uh, I think I'll defer to our next speaker. I believe that's Todd. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, before we go to Elizabeth, uh, I just wanted to remind everybody to please type in your questions as they occur to you, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. We don't have a lot of questions currently, so if you do have a question, uh, this is a good opportunity to type it in. And uh, with that, I will turn it back over to our next speaker, Elizabeth Krause. Great. Thanks very much. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. I am a tax lawyer. Um, I also co-lead the power practice, which covers all manner of bills, including storage, um, as well as carbon capture and hydrogen, all that other fun stuff that um, Russ talked about earlier. Um, 
I promise not to bore you with um, really boring tax stuff. This is all really relevant to everybody. Um, and there are a lot of details in here that we will sort of skip over in the interest of brevity. Um, however, because there are a lot of details, if anyone has questions, you know, as, as we just said, please put them into the chat or we can always, I'm always happy to uh, follow up with folks too. So um, Russ gave you all a, a fairly high level overview of a few of the different tax credit programs. One thing that um, he asked me to cover, um, maybe for better or for worse, um, is the energy community's adder. So as Russ said, right, look, the new tax credits are set up to have this really tiny base credit rate, which is almost irrelevant, frankly, with a 5x multiplier for meeting wage and apprenticeship requirements. There are also these bonus credits, particularly for the investment tax credit, which matters most for storage. One of those bonus credits is domestic content, which Russ talked a little bit about, and I'll follow up on in a minute. Um, and then the other is energy communities. Energy communities is a really interesting adder. It's another 10% of the ITC, the investment tax credit. It's curious the way it's set up, okay? There are these three buckets. One is brownfield sites. Now the, that citation there is just to the EPA guidance around what a brownfield site is. Um, so we know that Congress wants you to go locate on a brownfield site. That's easy enough in principle. There are some mapping tools that are available from the federal government that shows you where brownfield sites that are recognized, that are registered as such, are located. But bear in mind, there are a ton of other places in this country that fit within the definition of brownfield that just haven't been registered. So, so if you go look at those maps, don't limit yourself to the map actually think through or talk to your council about whether or not a specific site is a brownfield and just hasn't been registered as such. This second category is really irritating because it's so detailed and it relies upon highly detailed, highly specific information that just isn't particularly publicly available. We've tried and tried and tried to narrow this down. Ultimately though, what we need is Treasury to submit or to provide in guidance, some kind of a list, frankly. Um, they have the ability to go out and get this information from local employment departments, from local tax or tax departments and things like that. You know, your average tax lawyer even just doesn't really have the avenues to get that very easily anyway. And even when we can get it, you know, query how confident you are in it. The third bucket is another one that's, it's actually fairly easy. So census tracts, right? We're all familiar with the census tracts. You think about that and then you figure out, okay, has a coal mine closed after 1999? Or has a coal-fired electric generation unit, not necessarily the whole plant, but the unit been retired after December 31, 2009? Uh, or is your site in a census tract that adjoins those areas? Now, some of this information is available from federal government agencies in publicly available formats, um, particularly around coal mines. Um, electric generation units are not as closely tracked by the federal government, or at least not for uh, public reporting purposes. But it is not all that hard to figure out if a coal-fired electric generation unit has been retired. Um, you know, often publicly available sources like Google, newspapers, things like that are available to indicate that information. And then you just really need to confirm it in diligence. So some interesting categories here. We are seeing some sites already that fit into energy communities with enough confidence that we are relatively comfortable saying, yeah, that 10% adder ought to be available. However, those are few and far between because we need guidance around some of these categories. There are actually some gray areas here. We're expecting to get guidance on energy communities and domestic content in fairly short order, likely in Q1 of 2023, maybe even early in the year, maybe January, maybe early February, but don't quote me on that. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Now, what I'm really here to talk about is a couple of different structuring things that we have in mind here now. The old way of structuring any kind of investment that include that involves the investment tax credit or for that matter the production tax credit generally involved some variation on a partnership structure partnerships for those of you who don't spend your hours staring at the internal revenue code basically means 
sort of a, a joint undertaking by two or more people, legal people, they could be individuals or, or entities, coming together with the goal of earning a profit. And not just sharing losses, although we do also care about how they share losses. And so it doesn't actually have to be enshrined in an entity like a state law partnership or a state law LLC, but that is pretty typical. And so the old way we used to do this is we'd have this thing, this entity that we want to be treated as a partnership for tax purposes, which again, don't necessarily care that much about the state law entity as long as it's not a corporation. And then we need to have somebody who wants tax credits, the person we usually refer to as the tax equity investor. That person is going to have to be a partner of the partnership. These are all very loaded terms to a tax lawyer. And then they're going to be somebody else in that tax equity partnership, usually a developer or an affiliate of the developer. Now, this kind of structure mattered for storage because for many years now we've we've allowed, we've we've been comfortable that the investment tax credit is available in the context of a storage facility, a battery or what have you, that's tied in and powered by something like solar or some other technology that qualifies for the ITC. They've always had to be twinned and the storage had to be powered predominantly, if not entirely, by the uh, renewable energy generation facility. Now this structure, as you can tell, is pretty complicated. Um, and this is a highly simplified model, by the way. Um, so we've got a lot of different players involved here. We've got the tax equity investor we already talked about. We've got the developer. We've got a lender somewhere, usually either lending to the developer, what's what we call back leverage. There's somebody building the facility. That's the EPC or engineering procurement and construction provider. There's an OEM, an original equipment manufacturer somewhere. They often go on site for commissioning purposes. There's an off taker, AKA the person buying the power. Um, and then there's usually a ground less or somebody who owns the dirt the facility is located on. So it's it can be fairly complicated. Next slide, please. And there are some problems with it too. There are some historic issues here. We've got this ownership requirement, which is ultimately tied in with the tax partnership rules. That generation facility needs to be owned for tax purposes, not just you know a name on a piece of paper, by a partnership, and then that partnership needs to be, honest to God, bona fide classified as a partnership for federal income tax purposes. And trust me, the opinions on this are long. Um, and the tax equity investor must be a partner in that partnership, and the opinions on that part are also very long. This means that for my purposes, there needs to be potential for profit and exposure to loss, like I mentioned. The tax equity investor can't just be in it to buy the tax credits. They also have to have some minimum cash flow expectations. It doesn't have to be a lot. Usually there's a preferred return of about 2%, and then they get a little bit of cash some way, somehow in distributions. And then, then there are some restrictions on involvement by tax exempt organizations and government, So, which means that generally speaking, the class of people who are willing to be a tax equity investors is pretty small. And then there's some minimum investment requirements, which all comes into timing of cash flow. And of course, that investor, that tax equity investor doesn't want to be in the structure forever. All they're really interested in is the tax credits and some depreciation deductions. So they want their interest to be as close to debt as I will let them be basically, or their tax lawyer will let them be. And so this, there's this fine dance around when do you get out? How do you get out? Under what terms, under what circumstances? How do you get paid in order to execute, in order to exit the structure? So we usually have options and things like that. There's all, always an issue also with a potential that the IRS will come in and say, you didn't do good enough. And what that means is that you have some potential that the IRS will say, the tax credit that the tax equity investor claimed was never available or not available in the amounts claimed. There's also some concern about, well, even if we did it right to begin with, has there been a problem 
in the first five years, which is what we call the recapture period. This is the period during which it's really important that the structure be maintained and the facility be operated so that the IRS doesn't come in and claw back some of the tax credit, okay? And then there's also an issue for some investors, particularly large corporates who've been coming into the tax equity space over the last few years, they don't want to have a solar facility on their balance sheet. I mean, think about the very large corporate names that come to mind for most people, you know, when they're standing at the kitchen sink, it's things like McDonald's, and Walmart, and Safeway and stuff like that, right? Those corporations are not in the business of running facilities, running solar facilities or storage facilities. That's just not what they do. And they don't want it on their balance sheet because it confuses their investors, quite frankly, causes problems. So that's also part of the issue here with the traditional model. Next slide, please. Now, one of the things that the IRA did, and this is perhaps the most revolutionary aspect of what the IRA did, the Inflation Reduction Act, is they created, um, oh, sorry, excuse me. There are some other models that are old models too that we won't talk about. Next slide, please. One, so back to what the IRA did that was so revolutionary. We, we've gone through some of the requirements here for the simple model for tax equity investment and, and you have a flavor now for how complicated and irritating it is. Um, what the IRA did is they said, okay, well, we're gonna throw most of that rule book out the window. Now you can sell tax credits. You just have to take cash back. And the person who buys the tax credits, we're going to look to, we, the government, are going to look to as the person who's entitled to the tax credits, who's subject to recapture and all that fun stuff. What this means ultimately for storage, because storage now qualifies all by itself, for federal income tax credits, doesn't have to be twinned with solar anymore. What it means is that just about anyone who's taxable can buy a storage facility for whatever reason they want, and they can transfer the tax credit to anyone who's willing to pay for it. Now, that significantly loosens up a lot of the restrictions that I've always had to deal with. And it presents a lot of new opportunities for how to fund these facilities. Now, it's not just all roses and rainbows here. There are some downsides of transfer. One, you can only transfer the tax credit. You can't transfer depreciation deductions, which is what tax equity investors have historically paid for in part. So that means that transferred tax credits are not worth as much as tax credits that go out to an investor through a tax equity structure. And so also cash has to be paid. Also, because the transferee becomes the taxpayer in the IRS's view, but they don't actually have any ownership interest in the facility, they have risk without the historical protections that ownership gets you. Ownership isn't just burdensome, it also gives you access to the asset and it gives you access to the, ca to the asset's cash flow. And that's really comforting to somebody who's going to spend millions of dollars buying tax credits. So transfer is not a silver bullet, but it is really great because it provides so many more options for not only financing these systems, but also for allowing people to actually use tax credits. Transfer all by itself should significantly expand the market for people who want access to tax credits and therefore hopefully significantly expand the opportunities for installation of clean energy facilities, generation facilities, storage, biogas production facilities, hydrogen, carbon capture, all sorts of interesting things that are really crucial to the energy transition. Okay. Now the other really revolutionary thing that happened in IRA is this concept of direct pay. Now, direct pay and transfer, I feel like you really kind of need to look at side by side. Transfer is really intended for taxable organizations, you know, for the Googles of the world, for the banks of the world. 
all of those people and others too. Direct pay is really intended for the tax exempts of the world, state and local governments, tribes, 501c3s, 501c6 industry associations can play too. Basically anyone who's not subject to tax, as well as electric co-ops, which you usually see only in rural areas. And so what direct pay is, is it says, hey, all you exempt org people who have historically not been allowed to play in the tax credit space, now you can. And so what happens is if I've got a state and local government, that's my client, and they want a battery facility because it's gonna help them with their, I don't know, um, emergency preparedness plans or something along those lines. And they wanna own the battery for various reasons and they've got the cash to buy the battery. Now they can say, okay, here's the battery. I just bought it, I installed it. Now, treasury, write me a check. It, you know, there are details in there, but it is generally speaking, a relatively simple process, or it's intended to be a relatively simple process. We will get guidance around how this works, what the exempt org must do in order to obtain the check from Treasury. Expect some reporting. Expect a need for diligence. Expect a need to put together an audit file in preparation because Treasury and IRS are not really used to dealing with exempt organizations outside of the employment context. And so this is going to be a, <clears throat> this is going to be a little new for everyone. Now, direct pay is available for taxable organizations in limited circumstances. They can get the credits for carbon capture and hydrogen and one of the manufacturing credits that Russ talked about earlier in the form of direct pay for a limited period of time. And then they have to take the credit for the rest of it. But for exempt organizations, generally speaking, you can take direct pay on just about every credit that there is now. And since we're focusing on storage today, definitely for storage. It's really helpful. Now there's another sort of caveat, actually two caveats, um, one that I didn't put on the slide accidentally, for direct pay. One is that if you're using exempt bond financing, you're gonna lose up to 15% of your credit, okay? So weigh the pros and cons. Is it better for you to use, if you're a state and local government or a tribe or something like that, is it better for you to use exempt bond financing or is it better for you to get the full credit? It's just, it's, it's a choice. And the other thing too is that starting next, starting in 2024, the amount of credit that's available will be reduced unless certain domestic content requirements are met. Now, Russ talked about these a little bit earlier. This is sort of a strange situation where what we've got, we've got a general domestic content adder. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the basic ability to use direct pay. Basically, if a facility has begun construction, which means certain specific things, before 24, no haircut. If it begins construction after 23, so in 24 or later, now we think you're gonna have to start meeting domestic content requirements. Now, the reason why I caveat that as we think is there's a fairly broad exception that is baked into the statute, which we'll get guidance on, okay? And if that exception, if those exceptions are used, then you can avoid the haircut. This is really important in storage for a couple of reasons. One, we just don't have the domestic supply right now. Two, even if we start to get some of the domestic supply, or excuse me, even if we start to get suppliers to meet the requirements for EVs, those requirements are very different than what we've got for domestic content, generally speaking. And those rules for EVs can be met with supply from sort of friendly nations, whereas the domestic content rules, they're, they're different. It has to be the US. And so it remains to be seen how impactful the domestic content caveat is for direct pay. And it's gonna be really, really, really important that Treasury hears the voices of people who are planning on direct pay 
and who want to use direct pay so that Treasury understands that they may need to have specific exceptions, special exceptions for storage. Uh, next slide, please. Now I talked about how um, transfer is not a silver bullet. Direct pay is super useful, but also not a total silver bullet. And part of the reason why they're still a little bit complicated is because of how the structures work or will work once we get it all sorted. And so tax equity partnerships still make a lot of sense for that, that reason, really. They're very cookie cutter. We know what to do with them. We know what the terms need to be. We know how to negotiate them. There's also a very clear impact story, especially if the investor can get renewable energy certificates, RECs, or in other circumstances, other kinds of similar certifications. With the traditional models, we also have some opportunity for intermediaries like banks who are already familiar with this market. There's a lot of new structures that they can use that combine a traditional partnership with transfer or something along those lines, basically to sort of loosen up the market a little bit. Next slide, please. So transfer, we're gonna see probably some funny structures. There's gonna be some real financial sort of tools here, things that are a little foreign to you know the average person. Um, we'll see some partnership structures, some LLCs that are sort of intentionally broken for tax purposes, that is possible. Um, I don't know that that's gonna be particularly typical, but it does provide some risk protection that's attractive. We'll probably see some situations where the lender to a project agrees to take the, the tax credits and transfer structure and basically just recharacterizes some of the loaned principal as a payment for the tax credits. The reason why we may see that particularly on smaller projects is because the lender already has protections out the wazoo in the debt agreements and therefore they don't really need the extra protection of a tax equity structure. They already, they already have tons of protection. Um, we might see some things that are sort of Frankenstein agreements, sort of supply agreements that have some protections in there. I'm actually working on one right now where, um, although my client probably wouldn't like me to call it a Frankenstein agreement, the point is, is that it's a transfer agreement. It's a supply agreement, like you're just selling something, but it does have a lot of different protections layered in to make sure that the parties have the confidence they need to transact. With the production tax credit, we may also see some other fancier structures. I, this is important because we're gonna see some changes in the PTC over the next couple of years. Um, they're gonna be pretty exciting to really sort of turbocharge the PTC. Not super relevant for storage though. Uh, next slide, please. And then finally for direct pay. Direct pay for tax exempts, like I said, is a really big opportunity, especially, especially for people who are thinking about you know, emergency response, emergency preparedness, uh, stability on the grid, uh, microgrids, things like that, that we've seen some of, for example, some of the smaller tribes out in California do, like the Blue Lake Rancheria, it's very famously. And so I think what we're gonna see is we're gonna see direct sales to utilities that are tax exempt, as well as governments, um, whether that's a tribe or a state or a city or whatever. Uh, we'll see build transfer agreements, which are fairly typical already, although not particularly in fashion in the last couple of years. Um, and we'll see just outright purchases, I think, for storage. It'll be possible also to have structures where you've got a utility, a government utility or a government organization act as a tax equity investor, which can be really nice because at that point, they don't have to put in quite as much into the structure. The danger with that is that you would need the tax exempt organization to pay more for the tax credits than they would otherwise because the depreciation for, for a variety of reasons will be either reduced or lost. Um, you can also have sort of transfers, we think maybe to utilities or governments. This is important because if you've got a situation where a taxable person is gonna go in perhaps on a triple P agreement, private partnership or something like that, build a facility, operate the facility in principle, we think they can transfer the tax credit to the government 
and then the government can claim direct pay. There are detractors in that, and including some of my colleagues, we argue about it a little bit. Um, we need some guidance to make it clear that that's available. If it's not available, though, you can still work it out with an economic transfer, just payments. Um, and with that, I will I will stop boring you with tax details. But thanks very much for for joining in. And if anyone has any questions, please do put them in the chat. We're happy to follow up afterwards. Okay. Thank you to all of our presenters. I think we are in good shape here to get to a no good number of questions. If everyone could just turn their camera back on, if that's possible for you. If not, um, you can still respond verbally to these questions. So first question, currently, the energy storage market is largely dichotomized between utility scale and on-site applications. What will IRA provisions do to incentivize distributed shared energy storage at various locations within a distribution system? This effort would reduce inefficiencies of on-site capacity and open the market to alternative storage technologies such as flow batteries, which work best in mid-scale scenarios. I, I think the question is, how the IRA provisions apply to aggregated distributed energy storage, if I'm interpreting that correctly. I can offer an initial quick comment. Uh, a good thing about IRA is that it uh, does not uh, discriminate, so to speak, between uh, behind the meter, distributed or not, and front of the meter. Uh, as compared to IJA, uh, a number of the programs under IJA that support storage, uh, such as the, the, the 355 million, uh, DOE has, has clarified that the front of the meter uh, projects, topic 2B, uh, must be transmission connected. So there is some actual uh, disfavoring of the distribution system under IJA, at least that particular program. To my knowledge, not under IRA. Okay, anybody else have a comment or should we move on? I know I would agree with that. I mean, just to elaborate a little bit, right? The the new standalone storage credit significantly opens the field. So if it's a battery and it's sitting somewhere and it's operating, qualifies for the new ITC. Um, it, it's not really that detailed anymore. So in any, any configuration that you want to pursue, Generally speaking, there should be a way to get confidence that it qualifies for the new tax credits. Okay. Uh, somebody is asking about uh, EVs, electric vehicles, as mobile storage. How will vehicle to grid integration technology determine IRA eligibility? I can take that. That's a super interesting question. From a purely tax credit perspective, and of course the folks from DOE should jump in here too, but from a purely tax credit uh, perspective, with an EV as a storage unit, you've got three different credits at least that are involved. New, the new infrastructure credit, which allows bi-directional charging, by the way, um, and there's there are some components there that are useful for uh, residential. Um, the new EV credits, of course, which, you know, Great, they can be used as bi-directional storage capacity. There's nothing in there that prohibits that. And then also the storage credit itself, which, you know, <laughs> query if you're gonna use it that way. But, and then there's also the new manufacturing credit. The new manufacturing credit that Russ talked about earlier applies to storage devices for a number of situations, as well as their inverters. And so there's, potential there to create a situation where you've got multiple tax credits in play for the whole value chain. Um, Gina or, or Wayne, is there anything to add there from the DOE perspective? I would just say in the loan programs office, we're agnostic there. And I, I would say we're seeing a trend towards uh, mobile storage, especially in school bus and heavy duty travel. Uh, 
uh, with using either the assets themselves or the microgrids they might be charging from and the battery storage there to provide bi-directional power flow. But we, we like them all. We're not discriminating on one over the other. Well, uh, this brings up a question that came in earlier. Somebody wanted to know whether hydrogen was going to be addressed today, and I responded that we're really addressing um, you know, uh, funding and tax tax incentive opportunities, not specific technologies. But since we're talking about EVs and distributed aggregated systems, are, I assume that their eligibility is defined differently in different aspects of of these programs, or is there some kind of overarching eligibility um, definition that applies? Both IJA and IRA have extensive hydrogen provisions, which we didn't purport to take on here. There's a lot of funding for both of those as well. It could, could be that my co-panelists know more about those than I. Yeah, this is Gina. I would say if someone has a specific question about hydrogen, we'd be happy to follow up by email and provide some more of that information. Okay, but as far as eligibility in general, I mean, if you have uh, something that's non non battery, doesn't necessarily have to be hydrogen. Is it program by program? Is it <clears throat> uh, is it defined in some kind of overarching way? Some of the IRA provisions are by technology, and some of them are tech neutral. So it just depends. Okay. There are significant buckets, just like you saw buckets for energy storage, there are significant bu buckets for, for hydrogen. Yeah, and energy storage is available for hydrogen storage too. I mean, it's expressly blessed in the statute. Um, the other tax credit provisions, it's been interesting actually to see DOE and, and Gina and Wayne, it sounds like maybe you could follow up on this separately, but we've seen some interesting coordination between DOE and Treasury around sort of syncing up some of the DOE programs with some of the new tax credits for hydrogen. So I, I don't know that I'd say that there's complete overlap. I mean, obviously Gina would, I think, differ with that, but um, it's been interesting to see the coordination, so. Yeah, I would add that DOE and Treasury have been in daily communication since IRA passed about all of these many, many provisions. Um, to figure out you know, how we're going to provide these to the public and what kind of guidance is gonna be given. So yes, lots of coordination and communication happening between agencies. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a couple of questions about whether resources have to be grid tied. Uh, one person asks, would the answers just given about EVs as storage instruments change if the EVs are used solely as vehicle to building and not as vehicle to grid? Is the grid connection required? If not, EVs can power homes without involving the grid. And somebody else is asking a similar question. Do residential battery storage systems with or without solar have to be grid tied in order to receive the 30% tax credit? Same answer as before. Same answer as before. Uh, there is some discrimination under IJA in terms of eligibility uh, under the demonstration program that had the LOIs, or has the LOIs due now on uh, next uh, week on the 22nd. Um, should have changed that in the slide, I realize. But under IRA, no. Is it storage is the question. It doesn't discriminate based on application. Yeah, but, but well, one caveat though. There, it's a different structure for residential than it is for utility or, or larger scale storage. So the, the Section 40 investment tax credit, the storage unit has to have a nameplate capacity of not less than five kilowatt hours. So it's not real big, but it's it's not exactly like the, the tiny <laughs> battery that I'm gonna plug into my panel in case my power goes out, right? Um, so there's a little bit of a dif distinction there, and particularly when you start to get into you know, pairing it with residential uh, residential solar, that's a completely separate bucket of, of credits, um, which we haven't covered at all here. Okay, so so not smaller than five, you said? 
five kilowatt hours for yeah. the ice yeah okay that's interesting um somebody is asking whether there's a limit on the ptc in terms of how many of the 10 percent adders can be stacked in other words if you get the 30 percent plus domestic content 10 percent plus energy community 10 percent plus low income area 10 percent can you get up to 60 percent or is it limited somehow to as to how many uh, stacking so, adders you can you can add on so storage is section 40 ITC, the investment tax credit, not the production tax credit, just small clarification. Um, so no, there, there's no limit. You can get up to 50% you, if you meet, you know, the basic classification, wage and apprenticeship gets you to 30. And you can do a 10% energy communities and a 10% domestic content. Um, there are additional credits for small solar and wind it's not clear that that would apply to storage it doesn't apply to standalone storage in theory it would apply to solar plus storage and if you were to do those um, which have pretty specific requirements and also an application period that hasn't quite opened yet that could get you to 70. but again it would have to be it looks like it would have to be paired with solar I, can imagine I love that we have moved from talking about the stacking of use cases to the stacking of tax credits. Yeah. Right. I was going to say I can I can imagine there'd be some letter rulings on the horizon for some of these questions. Oh, there's going to be some fun audits. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Tax question. Another tax question. Can you comment on the difference between the domestic content requirements on the ITC versus direct pay? I'm not sure I understand yeah. the question, but yeah. So I tried to get into this. It's complicated. Um, the domestic content adder is basically there are two categories. One, you look at your steel and iron content, which we think means structural steel and iron. That has to be 100% produced in the United States. Generally speaking, that means that the steel has to be, you know, bored or rolled or whatever here. Um, and then there's another category for manufactured products. 40% of the manufactured products across the facility have to be produced in the United States. There's a ton of gray area in that, and we're anxiously awaiting guidance. If you can meet those, then you can get the 10% adder. Okay. For direct pay, let's say you meet the domestic content adder. You should be okay on direct pay then. But if you don't meet the domestic content adder, it's just possible that you would meet the direct pay requirement, which basically is a haircut or a reduction in the direct pay amount. And the reason why I say it's just possible is because of the specific exceptions that apply to that haircut. They're, they're more lax than the exceptions or waiver options that might be available for the adder. Um, it's it's a little bit of a Venn diagram. Sorry. <laughs> it's the old golden okay. rule. Those who provide the gold make the rules, right? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, here's a question about energy as a service. How do IRA provisions apply to energy as a service providers? I'm not sure there's a distinction, but maybe there is. I mean, sort of the old old answer that Russ gave a few minutes ago, it, the use case, I mean, it matters in some cases, but energy as a service providers in the context of storage doesn't matter. Whoever owns the facility is the one who's going to get the tax credit or have the right to transfer it. And before you get to the energy storage as a service, you've got all the supply chain, you know, manufacturing facility, production, all that happens. And then the asset is bought by the service provider. So all that happens in, mm -hmm. uh, beforehand. That's right. OK. Um, uh, sort of similar question, is leasing energy storage eligible for tax credit? So you probably mean like in the old sale leaseback model? I, I, that's the question. I, I can't, I don't know what yeah, the person is intending to ask, but I'm assuming that means if you're leasing 
rather than owning can who takes the credit then yeah yeah so um the basic rule is whoever owns the asset takes the credit now the slide that i flipped through in like 30 seconds earlier which talked about a couple of other models is the sale leaseback model which is basically a financing lease um and an inverted lease model or lease pass-through model where basically there's an election to pass the tax credit to the lessee of a facility both of those options are available in the context of the ITC under law that applied before August 16th. The law that allows that is regulations that are ancient and a complete mess, which Treasury has been trying to rewrite now for several years. They obviously have to rewrite them now because we have some fairly material changes in the law. I suppose they don't have to, they should, and they are. Um, now, I don't know, we, we think sale lease specs will be fine. We haven't heard any indication that they won't. And we think that inverted leases will probably also be fine. We have not seen any indication that they won't. So I think the answer here is I am eagerly awaiting guidance to make sure that everything we've heard is true. Ordinarily, if we don't have that guidance that allows a sale lease back or that allows a lease pass through, then the person who owns the asset can claim the tax credit and will have the right to transfer it. So the ability to transfer opens up a possibility that a lessee could get the tax credit. They would just have to pay cash for it. And, and we don't know if an agreement to pay cash over time, like a slice of the rent, will be sufficient or if it needs to be paid in a lump sum. But I think suffice to say, we will have tools. We will have the ability to get it to a lessee one way or another. I just don't know exactly how that's going to work today. Um, I wish we had more time because we have more questions, but unfortunately, I think we've gotten to the end of our time here. Apologize to those who uh, we didn't get to your questions. We have a few upcoming webinars to announce, but uh, before we do that, thank you so much to all the presenters and uh, for everybody who's uh, attending. The webinar will be posted and the slides will be posted on the CISA website. And Anna, if you want to wrap this up. Yes, absolutely. So this was our final webinar of the year. We are starting off 2023 with a State of the U.S. Energy Storage Industry 2022 Year in Review webinar on the 10th in January. So make sure to go to our website, cisa.org backslash webinars, if you're interested and would like to attend that webinar. We also have one more energy storage webinar on on the calendar and one more in development so make sure to, to check back on our website to see when that comes online and then on the 23rd of january we have another awesome webinar about community solar which i would also recommend to folks that are interested in that topic so like todd said i just want to thank again all of our amazing panelists today emory wayne elizabeth uh, Gina and Russ, um, thank you all for attending today's webinar and, and spending this time with us in the holiday season. I hope everyone has a wonderful last few weeks of the year. Um, and just again, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.